Good evening, everyone. This is the regular monthly meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education on Monday, May 13, 2019 at 7 p.m. at Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. As a reminder, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board during the reception of visitors later on in the agenda. The board asks that anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. This can be placed in the basket uh, over there to the table to my right. They will be used to assist us in allocating time so that all of those who wish to have an opportunity to speak, um, so that all will have an opportunity to speak and, and help us follow up with you after the meeting. Tonight, the board plans to allocate 30 minutes to public comment. Please fill out a card if you wish to speak. The board will ask that each person plan to speak for no longer than three minutes so that all will have an opportunity to comment. We will invite those who have submitted a card to speak first, and if time allows, others will have the opportunity to address the board. Uh, as we always do tonight, we're going to go ahead and start off uh, the meeting with a flag salute with Pierce Downer School and Principal Collins. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce our 1819 Student Council for Pierce Downer. Sierra Neverell, our president. Lauren Mall, our vice president. Emily Doherty, our secretary. Mackenzie Wells, Mallory Risk, and Colin McGlone, sponsored by Ms. Minardi and Mrs. DeMarco, our fifth grade teachers. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I believe our student council has a short presentation to share with you. Student 
Council held two large fancy or formal clothes to donate to little workers. These clothes were donated so that, so that others had an opportunity to have nice clothes to wear to a job interview or a fancy event. Hello, I'm Mackenzie Wells, and I'm part of Student Council. This year, one of our spirits days was Christmas in July. Here's down our students dressed up in their best holiday and they in the keeping with the spirit of giving at the holiday season, Student Council also sponsored a collection of house food items and personal items to be donated to shared collections. Hi, I'm Colin McGlone and I am another member of Student Council. To really promote our USA Spirit Day this year, we combined it with the Surface Project. We invited students to join us at lunch recess to make cards for homeless veterans. These cards were delivered to the Midwest Shelter for Homeless Veterans in Wheat. Also with us today are two co-presidents for PTA, Stephanie Vroman and Mariah Cameron. Uh, hi, hello. Uh, thank you uh, for c having the Pierce Downer Student Council and the PTA here tonight to talk about some of the things that we've been busy doing all year. Um, I'm Mariah Cameron. This is my co-president, Stephanie Vroman. Um, Pierce Downer PTA has a commitment to better the education of our students, in addition to striving to support both the parents and the teachers uh, within our community. We're able to do this through a variety of events, educational tools, and of course, fundraising. Um, tonight, I'm just going to touch on a few of the things that we've been busy doing throughout this school year. Um, to start off, just some of the educational enrichment programs that we support. Um, a big one is field trips, as well as in-school um, learning experiences through a company called High Touch High Tech. Um, we um, hire them basically to come to the classrooms. The teachers get to pick uh, what they from a big list of things that they want to learn about. Um, and they uh, try to tie it into what their current curriculum is. Um, so this just provides the students with a good hands-on, uh, real-life experience, so to speak, based on what they're learning. Um, another thing we support or purchase for the school is Accelerated Reader Program. Um, this is a big one. It allows students to take quizzes on books that they have read. It also provides teachers with a breakdown of how the students performed and what they were, um, how well they were comprehending what they read. It also lets us uh, reward students for reading. We have a wall uh, where they can uh, get on the million dollar, uh, the mi not million dollar, million word wall. I wish it was dollars. Um, the million word wall. Uh, and we have some students that have even reached up to three million and five million words. So there's really some incentive there to um, continue reading. Uh, we also um, uh, provide four in-school assemblies for the kids. We do an art awareness program, which uh, parents volunteer to come in and teach an extra art lesson once a month, just to give some extra um, time in that region. Uh, we also support many of the clubs. Uh, one of them you saw here today is Student Council, uh, Hope Club, 
STEAM committee, service learning committee, healthy kids club, all of which are ways for students to learn not only educationally but how to support other members of our community and provide uh, community service. In order to create a sense of community in our school, we organize and support many different social activities. Uh, we had one just this morning, uh, the day after Mother's Day, we did Dads and Donuts. So uh, all the dads got to come in with their kids, and uh, for the fourth through sixth grade, we're doing K through three next week, but they got to come in and enjoy some donuts and conversation with their kids before school started. So it's a good way to get dads involved. We also do a dad's night out. Uh, that was earlier this year. We do a welcome back party and um, a welcome back committee, which we pair each new family with an existing family uh, in case they have any questions that they want to ask. Uh, we also put a sign in every new student's yard or new family's yard to welcome the student to the school. Just a little way to ease the transition. Um, we do a sweetheart dance and we have a mother-son kickball tournament that's coming up next uh, week. That's a big one for us. Hopefully it doesn't rain. Uh, we do an annual fun run, a Cubs family outing, um, a sixth grade uh, breakfast, which is also on the Friday before school gets out, uh, kind of like a little graduation ceremony where all the parents are invited. Um, and we provide a VIP day, which we just also had last week, uh, which went over well for our first and fifth grade families. Uh, students get to bring in a very important person in their life and teach them about what they do in school all day. Um, so that went over well. Uh, to help support our teachers, we, we offer a number of things. Uh, Teacher Appreciation Week was just last week, so that went off very successfully. We also um, provide a yearly staff supply allowance where teachers can purchase additional items that they might need for their classroom. And we have supported a number of teacher grants and wish list items in the past. Uh, most recent one that we're hoping to approve next week is a portable PA speaker system to allow us to bring it outside and use it for events like kickball and field day and also in the mornings before school it might make it a little easier to um, kind of get get everybody on the same page in terms of what we're doing um, we of course could not support all these wonderful things without fundraising our three main fundraisers are an annual giving campaign we did it we did a trivia night this year which was very successful t for us um, mainly because of a great committee that we had working for us as well as because of all of the uh, local businesses who are very gracious to help support um, our local PTAs. Um, and the last one that's kind of um, different from other schools maybe is we do a, this is our 10th anniversary of doing a Battle of the Bands fundraiser. 10 years ago we had a very musical group of parents at Pierce Downer who started um, these bands. This year we had, I think it was seven or eight bands perform at Bally Doyle on a Saturday night and we charge a cover and that uh, raises a lot of money for our school. We've been lucky to be able to continue it uh, with, uh, there's a lot of parents who did it 10 years ago who are still coming back to support Pierce Downer. So it's great. Um, and we also have had a number of new parents uh, join. So it's been really well, it's done really well. So thank you for letting us speak tonight to highlight some of the things that Pierce Downer PTA does to support our students, teachers, and our school community. Looking forward to a very busy end of the year. Thank you. Thank you. This one. All right. Thank you. And finally, um, since this is my first year at Pierce Downer and in our district, I thought um, I would share, or Lori Cole and I would share some of the ABCs of PD that we've learned throughout this year. Um, so, hopefully, uh, oh, thank you. A is for assemblies. Um, thanks to the PTA, we've had a lot of great assemblies at school that enhance our character education and other aspects of learning in school. Um, B is for buddy benches. We've had two buddy benches installed through the PTA and Mavens. We had an assembly to present those to the students as well as worked with students to learn how to properly use those and support each other through the buddy bench. Uh, we've just started some work on character development. So um, we used student groups and teacher groups and parent survey information and we are developing some character focus for next year. So that's some of the work in progress right now. Um, our first graders have uh, dogs come in and they get to read with the dogs, which is a highly popular program. Um, we do a lot of things to support learning about the environment. We've had two walk and ride to school days. Um, 
the third grade got trees to plant. We celebrated Arbor Day with the village by um, help, well, kind of helping them mulch the new tree in our parkway and um, various other um, activities, including a waste-free lunch. Um, and F is for fun run. I couldn't leave that one out. <laughs> it's a big event at Pierce Downer. Um, G is for giving. We do a lot of things to support giving through a service learning committee as well as Hope Club and Student Council. So those are some of the many things that we have worked on this year. Um, I didn't realize how big Halloween was <laughs> until I went to the first downer. But we had parade and parties and a wax museum and a haunted house contest and it was really a lot of fun. Um, I is for interests. Uh, I was really proud of fifth grade for trying out Genius Hour this year, but we also have all kinds of clubs going on for students to pursue their interests. Um, J is for Jump for Heart, and we had um, a week-long <laughs> celebration of jumping with loved ones, which helped the Healthy Kids Challenge raised <coughs> over $10,000 to support heart research. Um, L is for learning. You can see lots of great learning going on in our classrooms every day. M is for McTeacher Night. So this was something new we added and um, our teachers volunteered and had a second job for one night at McDonald's. We wound up raising um, over $600 and had a really great night with families and students. Um, and as for our nominee, Craig Kubinski, um, for a Distinguished Service Award. And I don't know where I would be without him. <laughs> um, o is for outdoor education. Camp Edwards was a big part of our learning, of the sixth grade learning this year, um, which was a great experience. We have lots of partnerships in the community, our PTA, our parents, through Mavens, Downers Grove North. And we recently, um, made a partnership with St. Andrews and Kids Hope USA to begin a mentor program for next year. So I'm really excited about that. Um, Q is a tough one, but Q is for Queely and lots of quality music. <laughs> um, R is for random acts of kindness. So together with our buddy bench, that those were, um, those were presented to students around Valentine's Day and to go along with that we did a random act of kindness week with a challenge for students each day. Um, you can see some of the post-its that they left around the school. S is for sensory tools. We have been working hard to provide um, sensory tools for our students. So we, our social worker and occupational therapist created a sensory pathway on the floor outside our first grade classrooms as well as really worked hard to outfit our occupational therapy room um, with lots of sensory tools for our students as well. And T is for teachers. They make all the difference as when they feel full of energy at the start of school. Yeah. Um, U is for us. Our PD families um, is another great feature of Pierce Downer. We meet about once a month and do some fun activities with cross grade level groups. Um, v is for the variety show. Again, another big deal, <laughs> um, but kind of a unique thing to run out the Tivoli. Um, w is for Watchdogs, which is another program we just started this year. So we have dads of great students come in for a half of the school day and volunteer in a variety of classrooms. We just started at the end of February and we've had 15 visits so far and um, it seems to be growing each week. So that's been a really nice program. And it's really exciting that the year is <laughs> So thank you very much for listening to our presentation. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all the wonderful things going on at Pierce Downer. Uh, we would like to invite all the student council members down here. We got some, some gifts for you if you just want to step over here to my left.
All right, next on to our non-action reports. Uh, the first thing up is recognition of students uh, for the Illinois Young Authors. The board would like to formally recognize the students who submitted original stories and were selected to attend the Illinois Young Authors Conference in Northern Illinois on May 18th. Congratulations. All right, next up, we're gonna do the spotlight on our schools, the preliminary staffing plans for 2019-2020 with Dr. Jane Uzentis. Thank you. Um, the spotlight tonight is not nearly as exciting as hearing about what our schools are doing and following the students. Um, however, it is very important information that we wanted to share with our board and with our community. And so we're going to take a little bit of time and talk about our process for staffing, how we do the planning, and then also I would like to update you on one of our councils that's come out of the um, strategic plan. And so. Strategic plan goal two is about connecting the community. Two of the objectives are, fo are focused on really that open communication, proactively sharing information about decisions, you know, really to build that trust in our community. And then the sec second objective, which is tied to the presentation tonight, is looking really at that consistency across the district. Um, developing systems to promote equity across our schools all of our schools and, and then specifically really looking at how do we allocate district resources consistently and equitably. So out of, thi out of that plan we, hit, we formed a working group, the Resources Review Council, and this presentation then is one first step in our improving our communications. Historically we have not really shared throughout the process the planning for staffing. Our, we, we begin at the district level, uh, really our meetings start in January prior to the upcoming year to start talking about our, anticip our anticipated student <coughs> enrollment, what do we anticipate, what do we think we need to plan for so we can obviously be prepared and um, be able to support through our budget what our needs are. The Resources Review Council, and through many, many, many conversations, really looked at, number one, what's that definition of equitable, which is in the presentation time I can share with I will share with you. And, and also focused on the communication piece. In, as we, a small group, a group of 20, as we talked about how decisions are made, we have parents in the group, we have teachers, we have administrators, that group itself felt like, oh my gosh, if this was just communicated more broadly, people had a better understanding to the background behind the decisions, we would have more support. And without that understanding, there seems to be question um, and, and people just don't really know all that goes into the deliberate decisions we make. Excuse me. Um, part of our work for that group, we set targets, which we've shared here, what we hope to accomplish in the upcoming year. And then we're just very, at the very beginning stages of talking about staffing for the related service staff, which would be special education staff, resource teachers, social workers. So the, I mentioned the definition of equitable. This is definitely very big overall um, philosophical what we hope in the district what we're trying to accomplish <coughs> is that this first paragraph every child really has timely access to what they need to be successful part of that conversation was also in order to provide children with that equitable those those opportunities across every building we have to do the same for our staff um, so you'll notice we've included resources are inclusive of the curriculum materials interventions that are available for all of our kids staff who also have that opportunity for training, collaboration, resources, um, to get to that place where we can best meet all needs of all of our kids, again, throughout all 13 schools. Our second paragraph really is what we were calling our disclaimer paragraph, if you will. There are times when federal guidelines, grants, do not allow us to spend dollars in a certain way that we would hope to spend them. And so when those situations arise, which is rare, but they do arise, um, we basically wanted to make sure we're communicating. We will make, as a district, we still are going to work toward coming up with some sort of solution to promote the equity across the district. So this, basically, this definition, at this point, we want to um, more broadly communicate. We want to bring to all of the working groups. Because the Resources Review Council, again, it's 20 people. We're not the ones making decisions across the district. We want to raise awareness to this goal of equity and being equitable for our board, our community, all of our curriculum committees, um, our various councils, and really as those different groups are doing the work 
and making decisions, we want them to have this at the forefront of their thinking to ask themselves, is this decision supporting our goal and our efforts to be, be equitable across our schools? So I mentioned the targets. Our Resources Review Council, again, we started with the classroom numbers. That is the easiest place to start as far as if you think about the different positions in the district. Preschool, our class size targets, which we are confident we will meet, are driven by the grant, very honestly. So that 15 to 18 is where we consistently have, have been within our preschool class sizes. Yes, In looking at gr our grades K-2, um, there was a number of conversations about what's that right starting point. You know, we, we are, we have in District 58, we're the neighborhood school concept. That is our model. That is going to then um, create different scenarios in different buildings because we have the neighborhood model. So we started with, well, what's 24, that ideal number, if we could have 80% of those classrooms or 24 or fewer, that'd be great. And so we set that as initial target. We will then obviously revisit that. And part of the other half of tonight's is showing you actual numbers with where we would fall. And then we'll do this again in September. We'll update our board with where we actually um, are falling in relation to our class sizes. In any case, part of our conversation was, you know, there's going to be classrooms that have 25, 26, 27. Kids are still getting an outstanding education. We don't want people to think based on a number that that's a disadvantage for a child. It's, it really depends on what the learning environment looks like, how we organize instruction. And so we, we try to remove ourselves from, we can't just get hung up on a number. It's gonna happen, and then when we have the 25, 26, 27, really the group felt, as long as we communicate openly about that decision and why and where the numbers are falling, they feel like, yeah, our, you know, staff will support, parents will support. It's that communication piece may have been missing in the past. So we put in that next layer of, okay, if we have 25, 26, 27, let's do a better job of communicating openly with staff, with parents, and across, you know, across the district. When we hit that 28, that was the number um, with, that we landed on. Um, we, our recommendation then is that there needs to be an action of some sort. There, ne that there needs to be a meeting. Let's talk about what additional supports we might put in place for the larger classroom of 28 or higher. Um, do we need additional staff? How would we maybe schedule our specialists? In, in a number of places, when we have the 28, we have a 31 at Hillcrest, a class size of 31. It depends. We can still support kids and, again, provide an excellent education based on how we arrange the time, the, the learning environment, so that they still have the opportunity for small group instruction. Perhaps we're scheduling our specialist, a reading specialist, a resource teacher to support those larger classrooms. So that's really that trigger point of we need, we need an action when we get to that 28. And we need to make sure we're communicating that action so people have a better understanding as to why and what, what that learning experience really looks like. So a similar model, if you look down, grades 36, our numbers. 26 or fewer, so we're, our goal is to have 80% of our classrooms hit that 26 or fewer. And then similar concept, the communication point is at 27, 28, when we get to 29, that, that really that trigger for a decision and action of some sort. <coughs> Grade seven and eight, we looked at two different things. One, it's the numbers are the same as we are using for three through six. That really, that 26 or fewer, is a nice number, is a manageable number. Um, it's really, you know, effectively we can organize our instruction. The other piece we looked at with middle school is really the better, having a better balance among the class sizes within a content area and across our middle schools. So historically, we have, in more recent years, we have tried to avoid having staff travel between O'Neill and Herrick because we don't want to pay for the travel time if we have the, the person at one school that's another teaching period, and we can bring down class sizes. As a result of that decision, over the last few years, we really um, have created a wider span in the average class sizes between those two schools. So Herrick, you would find a lot of 28, 29 class sizes. At O'Neill, the class sizes were much lower. And so part of our group was, okay, equitable, let's narrow that range. What can we do to you know, narrow, narrow that gap in those class sizes. And again, you'll see as I put numbers to this for the upcoming year. 
when we're thinking about our elementary, our art, music, PE, band, orchestra, that staffing decision is really based purely on number of sections needed. Um, so if we need, I'm trying to think of a, of a school, 21 sections at Leicester for music every week, I mean, that really drives the how many FTE, how many full-time equivalent teachers we need. And then the two positions we've not yet discussed, but that will be part of our next, either this coming year or the following, uh, really the teacher librarian and reading specialist. Currently our model has one per building. Um, and again, there's the conversation of we have a school of 200, we have a school of 500, a school of 600, with that same allocation. So again, we're not there yet with those conversations of what does it mean, how do we make sure we are equitable, how are we supporting kids, and, and putting some, maybe some systems in place um, as we talk about those additional positions. I apologize if I'm going too quickly. Good. <laughs> um, so when we look at our actual enrollment thus far, and please know it is very, very early. We've just opened registration. We don't have paid registration yet. We haven't asked even, we don't have OPEAP payments. So we are, these numbers are changing daily, weekly. Um, but we're, for purposes of tonight, just to get a sense of what we're planning for. For kindergarten right now, we have, we have are planning to staff two OPEAP sections at every building. That's at least what we budgeted for. We need to see where the numbers come out when we actually have parents register and make their payment. Um, and so I wanted to break down for the board the number of O'Keep, you know, roughly 84%, just over 84% of our families um, have indicated they will register for O'Keep, 10% of our families for the AM kindergarten class, and then just over 5% are still in that undecided area. As we look at that, and my, the chart below is really, if you think about how the kindergarten day is organized, the morning would have the keep students and half day students, which is why that average class size is, is a little larger, it's 20.6, so between 20 and 21. Um, so in the AM section, we are meeting our target that we have more than 80% of our classrooms would have 24 or fewer, we're very proud of that. Uh, the PM, so when the AM students go home, the re remaining students that are in O'Keep, that's really in that 17, 18 average class size. And 100% of our classrooms that would meet that target. As you look at this chart, and again, because it's so preliminary, I didn't bring out the whole, the, the breakdown by classroom, by building. That is something that we will share in September when we have our fully registered kids, so you can, see, you can see and identify specifically by building where the grade level is, how many classrooms in each grade level. But primarily, I, when I'm looking at these numbers, we look at the average for grades one through six. You know, some people like to see kindergarten put in, but because kindergarten numbers are different, AM and PM, that changes the, the overall percentage when you just lump them all in one. Um, so that, that average class size, <coughs> excuse me, um, we are, we have, you know, while, as long as I've been in my position, we, we have continued to decrease our average class size, which is, which is a nice accomplishment. We've added classroom teaching spots this year for elementary to dedicate and to, to prioritize lower class sizes. And so we really have that from the 2021 20, average at Bel Air to uh, and Kingsley to Leicester being at that 20, just over 24, some of the 25s. And then similarly, when you put the K-6 together, it's very, it's very similar. So that span, we are proud of. We've had, we had years where we really were more like 23 to 26 as an average class size. So we've made some, I think, some accomplishments there to bring our overall class sizes now. The part, that, that bottom row that talks about the range, that usually prompts uh, more discussion <laughs> as you're looking at, again, it's, if our model is a neighborhood school model, which we found we find very beneficial, there are so many positives to the way that we're organized. One of the impacts of that is going to be ranges where we would have a classroom of 16, and next year we have a classroom projected at Bel Air of 33. And you know, again, so those conversations initially looking at the number, it's very alarming. And if we 
part of our conversations are we need to do a better job again with communication. So using the Bel Air example, the principal of Bel Air has already had a family parent meeting for sixth grade parents to talk about this is what our numbers look like, this is what the learning would look like for your child, here's how we're going to support the classroom, here are other special certified staff who will be involved in their programming during the day. And so some of that just trying to be proactive and help parents have a better understanding hopefully will alleviate that worry of, wow, that's a big discrepancy. It is. But it's also, we feel we found very good success in our model as long as, again, we can communicate how we're supporting kids because it can't be based just on the number on the chart. Um, as you look, I'm trying to, to look across, um, you will see, yeah, the spans, I mean, there are some narrower spans, so that's probably our widest span, but that's not uncommon. That's not uncommon, depending on the year, different school, similar range. When we look at our middle schools, one of the conversations related to both Herrick and O'Neill is, you know, the, the total size. Should those schools be better balanced? There are 200, you know, there are over 200 student differences right now. Again, it's our neighborhood school concept. And there are benefits, <coughs> whichever model we choose to um, use and to support. One of our goals with middle school was really more focused on looking at the content areas, looking at the math, ELA, science, balancing those class, the average class sizes between the two buildings. And so for the upcoming year to accomplish that, we have increased FTE, so we have increased our middle school staff. The other um, way to accomplish this was to move some teachers from O'Neill to Herrick or, and to have some traveling teachers. So for the upcoming year, in order to accomplish this, that is, that is what our plan is so we can better support and we can really get closer to our range is by, by moving staff. So when we look at our targets, I wanted to show by grade level how we did with the 80%. So really we are, again, because we knew the targets as I went into staffing, we could work together, the ASC team, and work with you know, where we are with our budget to try to accomplish a number of these targets and try to reach our goals. Uh, grade two and grade four right now are the two grades where if the numbers, if the enrollment comes in as is, we would not meet the target for the upcoming year. Uh, we still, we feel that's a celebration. We really didn't anticipate hitting all the targets in our first year. This really was just an initial conversation. The other piece when you look at the grade two and grade four, five of those classrooms that don't meet the targets are Lester and Highland. And so in that situation, we couldn't add a teacher anyway to bring those class sizes down, you know, based on the, the space in those buildings. As we talk about art, music, and PE, <coughs> I apologize, allergies. <coughs> I wanted to give our board a sense of the number of staff we have, the full-time equivalents, but also, again, depending on our model, there are other impacts. We can work through <coughs> any number of challenges, any number of impacts, but we also, again, it's that awareness of, depending on which building, you know, the model means something a little bit different. And so when you look at, for our specialists, Lester, we do have 12 classrooms, 12 PE classes doubled up, two classes, two certified PE teachers. Um, and really, they've done a great job. There are other districts that do have double PE classes, so we really can look at really organizing that day with, in more of a station type format as opposed to a they're not going to be playing a volleyball game. They're not going to be playing a basketball game. They're going to maybe do fitness stations so that we can really properly supervise and make sure all the kids in both classes are active. Um, at, at Highland, again, we have limited classroom space, so art and music doesn't have a dedicated classroom. Kingsley, we have hit that point also. We've added some classroom um, with their growth and their enrollment. We have added some classroom teachers for this coming year. Which also means that as we're planning and working with the building administrators, we have 12 teaching periods for PE that either they're going to be double classes similar to Lester, or they could use the multi-purpose room 
which is fine. Depending on what the unit is that they're teaching, the multi-purpose room works great. Um, it's really just being more organized and, and thoughtful in our planning for the equipment needs of which things you, you know, you can't, we're not bringing volleyball standards to the lunchroom at Kingsley. So it's really just that planning and organization at the building level. Um, but again, it's still a good experience for kids. It just takes, it takes time. It has to be thoughtful and planned out to make sure we can accommodate all, all of our classes. The next conversation with Resources Review Council focused on our related services staff, so our special ed staff. We are at the very, very beginning stages. This is, number one, it's challenging to help explain the rationale and the decisions behind the staffing. It's also not easily understandable. And so what our group is trying to do is can we come up with a way to put a structure, a system in that we can explain clearly so people have a better understanding as to why we have the number of social workers we do at different schools, why we have a number of resource teachers. You know, so we're still working on that. I mean, there is the rationale. It's not a pure mathematical formula. And, and we really are looking at a combination of the considerations. We look at total enrollment. We look at the number of students with IEPs. We look at the number of instructional assistants in the building. How many, also, how many students are receiving those tier three interventions? How many students are below the 16th percentile? So that combination of factors drives that overall, the ultimate decision. Um, but we're really still working on what is that right way to organize it and explain it. Because there definitely is a lot of confusion, even amongst our staff, as to how, how we've done some, made some of these staffing decisions. So we're still working on that for, um, actually really that's next year's work is that we've just initially begun with our council. We then actually brought the information to the administrative team, to the special ed committee, to the differentiation and assessment committee. It'll go back to the administrative team and then back to resource review council. So we have uh, Jessica and I are working very closely on that. This slide I added um, just for information for our board. This was a question. I thought it might be interesting just to even get a sense of how many social workers, so this is full-time equivalents, this is not people. So we have a number of part-time positions that would make up, obviously, the, the overall total for social work counselor psychologist. And then, next steps. Um, we will continue our work in the upcoming year to look again at our staffing for related services. We also, then in the fall, when we have our actual registration numbers and see how all of our enrollment plays out. We'll again monitor, look at our targets, possibly adjust targets, communicate that out. The thought would be a September board meeting would be the time to update our board and our community on how our enrollment um, is organized across the district. We want to begin conversations, if not next year, then the following. Again, remember the strategic plan is a four year plan. We can do it all in one year. Um, to really look at reading specialist position, interventionist, library teacher, instructional assistants. Again, with the goal of put a structure and system in place and then figure out how to best communicate that so that we can strengthen the understanding across our community. And finally, this slide, uh, this came from a conversation with not just resources review, but also feedback that has come to me from parents, from staff members. There's a perception, there's a feeling of, there's certain things we're not allowed to talk about. And I found that very interesting because that's not our intent as a district. But really, you know, you do have people say, well, what about capping classes? Do we cap all, all at every building? What about combination classes? Are we gonna have them? Aren't we? Can we readjust boundaries? I mean, every single one of these things has been brought up in a different, in one place or another. And my purpose here really is not to alarm anyone, because that's, that's why some people feel we can't talk about these. We, we absolutely want to be sensitive and recognize um, some of these topics could cause emotion, uncertainty, that it's just important let's talk about what is our model and make sure that we can stand behind our model, and people understand their model. And so from my perspective, and again, talking in our group, it was, 
we can talk about these. Let's look, let's think to next year. We have the new superintendent, our board, our admin team, as well as continuing our work. Let's talk about these things. So that we can talk about why one model would be better than another. We can talk about very deliberately why we're making the decisions we are. And then we can actually have better support behind the decisions we made, if that makes sense. Um, so these, again, these are not, if taken out of context, I do realize anyone looking at this one slide, <laughs> it is really just, just to start the conversation of, yeah, let's talk about why we would or wouldn't do any arrangement of these things in our staffing model. And with that, again, I know it was a lot of information, and I'm possibly raising more questions than giving answers tonight. <laughs> Are there any questions from board members? I'll, uh, it's not more of a question, it's more of a, just a general interpretation. <clears throat> From my perspective, staffing shouldn't be simple and easy. If it was, it, just, it, it, it would not account for the nature of, of being an equitable school district and the fact that we have 13 buildings. Uh, it's going to be <coughs> complex. It's, there's, there's no simple solution. I just, what I love about this uh, approach is, uh, and there's still more to come, I'm sure, but what I love about this approach is we have a number of tools in our toolkit to be able to know what are the challenges and levers that we can pull. And ultimately, we're empowering our leaders at the most local possible level, ideally our building leaders, our central administration, in a meaningful way to be able to know which levers make sense for that community and that, that, that teaching staff and so on. And so uh, I just appreciate you uh, uh, naming the different tools in, in the toolkit that are available and different levers you can and cannot pull. It's also helpful for us as we do make future staffing decisions to be able to look at this list of multiple levers and say, how are we thinking about the trade-offs among these? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's helpful for me as a board member to know what's going through through the uh, Resources Council uh, review process. And so uh, thanks for sharing it. Thank you. Yes, uh, the board recognizes how um, what a large undertaking this is that we do every year. And so uh, thank you for bringing this up now and giving, I think, the community and all the board members a lot of clarity. So we, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is the Facility Planning Council <laughs> update with Todd Dreyfall. tonight with Amy. Um, so this is, I will get to the, the graph, the line. Uh, this is our next touch point in our, uh, the, for the facilities planning council to present to the board uh, where we're at in uh, our planning process. Uh, I was thinking about this, there's only a few more uh, months, a few more meetings before August where our goal is to turn over a master's facilities plan for discussion and, and, and development from that point. Um, so we have some initial pieces as to where we're at and kind of a uh, structure and facilities and access uh, areas that, that we've met. Uh, last meeting uh, that the Facility Planning Council had was with the, I wrote it down because I never remember it, the Instructional Model Resor uh, Resource Council, <laughs> Review Council. <laughs> get closer <laughs> uh, regarding their findings and their discussion uh, and that I will get to uh, we're coming to a community engagement session in the next couple of weeks with uh, that information as well as what the facilities planning council has has come up with so uh, this is kind of a piece as to where we're at for the summer and then uh, I want to get to our guiding principles one of the pieces after all of the conversations and uh, deliberations through com all the community engagement sessions and staff sessions have come down to three main guiding principles for the planning uh, for facilities. Uh, safe and healthy environments, 21st century learning, and connectedness. And then putting within those structures uh, the items that have been listed as the top important pieces for uh, the community to and for the district to, to review and, and to focus on uh, and, and many of these have come through the strategic plan 
but then they were also reiterated through all of that communication pieces, both through staff and through the community. So it's kind of come times two uh, through that process uh, over the last two years of, of work. So with that, I think we'll turn over to Amy and let her go through <coughs> some of the process of where we're at with the, with the concepts. Thanks, Todd. As Todd mentioned, the guiding principles kind of reinforce the strategic plan three, which the district started off with uh, a while back. And it's kind of nice because when we first started this process with the visioning and the community, um, community engagement sessions and the staff engagement, it, it just reaffirms that those priorities are still held um, high on the list to look at for all the facilities. Um, so without going back and 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 look um and kind of forcing people to look at that strategic plan model it, it really just kind of reevaluates and re refocuses everyone on those key priorities um, today we're going to look at kind of what key drivers of a master facility plan are and um, as an architect in, uh, in the community because I also live in the community and uh, these buildings hold near and dear to my heart. And, and looking at it from kind of the four key drivers up on the board um, really deal with building specific. So as we start the conversation of, I like to use the word parity instead of equity, because not every building is the same. So while we're gonna provide the same opportunities at all your facilities, looking at what does that mean um, for building specific? Uh, because, for instance, uh, Whittier and Henry Puffer are two of your oldest buildings, so they were built back in 1928 and 1936, and so they might take a little bit more to get to that same opportunity level, depending upon what we're looking at. So, again, looking at it from a parity standpoint, creating safe and secure atmospheres in all of the buildings, looking at indoor air quality and what does that mean, and 21st century learning opportunities. Regardless of um, building improvements, all buildings need to be maintained. So what does that look like at each of the schools? Then these next two points deal really with um, district-wide connected issues. And so these can impact all of the buildings by looking at and exploring grade reconfiguration. So when we start to explore the idea of a 6-8 model for a middle school center, you automatically free up classroom space at all of your elementary schools. And then also evaluating the district facility use. Longfellow on ASC has been a conversation in the works for, for many years now, and, and looking at efficiencies in consolidating the administrative staff. So in a master facility plan, um, there's kind of four main ingredients that we're looking at for District 58. Maintenance, as I mentioned before, no matter what you do, there's gonna be operational costs just to keep that building maintained and up to date with, with your, your HVAC systems, your mechanical systems, um, health life safety issues, uh, site improvements. When we talk about safe and healthy environments, we're really talking about that secure entry secure vestibules, that indoor air quality, and looking and exploring the opportunity to provide air conditioning at all the schools. 21st century learning, paving the way for the future. Um, education has changed over um, the last several years, and how do you provide those opportunities for not just today, but for the future to come for students? And then something that we're calling comprehensive improvements, which really focuses on the middle schools, Carrick and O'Neill, and looking at that 6-8 middle school model. And what does that mean? Because as you move um, the sixth grade students over to Herrick and O'Neill, there's going to be larger improvements that need to accommodate for um, the added enrollment. 
So today's focus is really going to be looking at the, the middle schools and seeing if it's feasible um, at both campuses or at both sites uh, for a 6-8 model to occur. These aren't detailed drawings, by the way. They're, they're concept planning uh, ideas of, of locations on your existing sites of where possible additions might occur. We've been working with the facilities planning council um, and looking at the, these areas um, and talking through kind of some imp implementation that, that might arise from, from looking at this. So what you're seeing up on the screen right now is the Carrick Middle School and the existing floor plan. So over to kind of up towards the upper right hand corner off the page would be Ogden Avenue which is more of a commercial district. Towards the left is a residential, and then down further south is on the page or below the page um, is the uh, where the playground area is, as well as um, North High School is just slightly across the street. The main entrance is identified in as with the red arrow. So, in our first concept over at Harris, we look at adding a an addition, possible addition, up towards the top page, really looking at consolidating your administrative staff in the building and creating a secure vestibule entrance, looking at possibly reimagining the library and classroom additions, expanding the cafeteria, because with the added enrollment, you have to now um, be able to seat more students in the cafeteria, as well as feed more students. So um, as we move, as we move clockwise from the upper uh, top of the page, we look at a possible kitchen expansion. Uh, the PE spaces, the small gym that's currently over at Herrick, really can't accommodate a uh, class size, so looking at expanding and making an ex auxiliary gym space. And then a two-story classroom addition towards the south. So Herrick is on a, a sloped site. Um, if you've ever been and walked around, so it has the opportunity to have, well, this is the first floor plan. When it drops, you're actually going to get daylight in those spaces. So towards, while well, it says a two-story addition, it would really be kind of at grade level when we move around the, around the site. Um, Herrick is, is a complicated building. As I was walking through the space, it, kind of looking through it, um, stairwells and how, how to get and uh, navigate. Um, we took a look at a second concept that might be a possibility as well. Um, again, looking at um, a, a smaller addition, administration or admin office addition to create that secure vestibule. We'd still have to look at kind of a kitchen expansion for the added enrollment. Um, and, and the uh, gym expansion. But that two-story classroom addition really focusing towards the south of the site um, and, and looking at kind of in between where, where the building is currently um, towards the fields. Over at Neil, we're look this is the existing uh, floor plan. So up towards the top of the page would be 59th Street. The YMCA is towards the left, and then down towards the bottom of the page is, is the, the play fields as well as Fairmount. Uh, the one unique thing about O'Neill is that it joins with another one of the district's properties, so you have a little bit of room between the elementary school and the middle school um, that is available to look at. O'Neill, while uh, it accommodates fewer current students, it also has and hosts specialty programs. So while it looks like O'Neill doesn't have as many students as Herrick because of the specialty program needs that are currently at O'Neill that take up more, um, uh, this, more space per student, essentially, in those program needs, um, we have to take everything into consideration when we start to look at, at O'Neill specifically. So much like Herrick, 
the administration um, office area is split throughout the building. So looking at consolidating administrative offices to be centrally located and make more efficiency um, within the school. Looking at um, reimagining where the main entrance was. When I pulled up to the school for the first time, you park in the parking lot and the first thing I looked at, I'm like, oh, there's the main entrance as you walk in. It's kind of this grand entry. No, that's, <laughs> there's a little sign on the wall that says main entrance around the corner. As you walk around the corner, it, it's, it's kind of uneventful. Not that it, it needs to be uh, a, a very celebrated space, but at least welcoming to some extent. So looking at more welcoming experience for visitors, um, parents to come into the school and be invited in. The classroom addition, um, over at O'Neill would occur on, on the east side of the site, the majority of classroom addition, as well as utilizing part of the existing <coughs> courtyard um, and the opportunities that a courtyard um, have. So where the current science labs, I learned from talking with staff at the school that the current science labs, the curriculum actually takes advantage of those courtyards and uses them for curriculum. So the, the opportunity of, of providing additional classroom space that feeds into that courtyard. And then an expansion, again, because of the added enrollment for expanding the cafeteria and the kitchen area down towards the south. Still providing ample amount of space for outdoor play activity that would occur. Now the other 11 elementary schools, what does that mean for them? Um, Maintenance, obviously, looking at that um, holistically for all the buildings. The creating a secure entrance at each of the buildings and, and looking at the opportunity to provide um, better indoor air quality and for the buildings that don't, aren't currently air conditioning, what would that take? By moving sixth grade over to the middle schools, as I mentioned earlier, frees up classroom space. And at an initial glance, it looks like it's approximately about two classrooms per building. So there's an opportunity to look at, at that 21st century learning and, and what does that mean for each one of the buildings. So what you've seen is a very initial beginning process of does does our current sites for middle schools fit into a feasibility of, of what we might need a given enrollment. We're looking at using the demographic study that we have um, with that structure and, and going forward as to what that enrollment would be uh, per building. Um, and then of course the, the review of what happens at the elementaries as far as space and reconfiguration of the vestibules and security uh, as well as a lot of upgrades. The maintenance pieces in that um, have been part of that conversation the last year or two with an update um, on the facilities and all the electrical upgrades and things that need to happen. Uh, next steps are uh, going forward is that uh, this piece as well as um, what the uh, Instructional Review Council has come up with and some of their findings would be presented in a uh, community engagement sessions on May 21st and 22nd. Uh, we have also uh, have a date now of May 29th uh, that will go out uh, as an announcement for staff um, after school for that as an opportunity. And then as we come back and then can reconfigure, the FPC will meet, take that information in uh, from those sessions on the, 20, on the 28th from the community engagement sessions and then we'll, we'll fold in the staff things after that and then evaluate um, master plans and some additional items and then start to look at costs. Uh, you <coughs> will next month have some very, very rough cost estimates based on a square foot, squitted, mm, excuse me, a square footage basis of uh, upgrades. Obviously the things as we get them more narrow into focus, um, we get a little more uh, better at, at, at the accuracy, but this will be an initial view. And then going forward, coming into the August meeting, 
with a um, presentation of a long-range plan. So questions? So are these enrollment proposals the, the driver or are they the result? The enrollment projections come from uh, the demographic study. Uh, the district has had a demographic demographer for several years and there was an updated um, demographic study in the fall uh, that was presented to the board, I believe, September, October. And so that is our, our most current numbers that we've used um, by boundary area uh, to do our estimates and that's moving the sixth grade forward as they're established um, given those numbers. Obviously, you know, those conditions continually change and adjust and, and so we continually watch for those. Um, but as of right now, that's the numbers that we're using for, for projections. Does so that Steve, make, as, you're, that as you're looking at the presentation, um, as you look at the current um, map, that, that Amy was presenting, the enrollment figures there are approximately the current enrollment figures, so 655, 655 students for Eric. Mm -hmm. If um, you look at the model that shows some of the proposed addition spaces, um, the en enrollment there is with the proposed grade levels of sixth or eighth grade, keeping in mind that this is just very rough estimates and it doesn't take into account if we want to move programs, if we do want to adjust boundaries, if we want to enroll students differently, that would create some differences in the enrollment. It would also likely create some differences in how we build out those buildings. <clears throat> but as Amy um, nicely pointed out, there, there are those differences in where programs are placed. So if we try to balance enrollment between the two middle schools, if that were one of the board's goals, we would also then have to look at those special programs that currently most of them are um, hosted at O'Neill and we'd be shifting those over in all likelihood at least some of them to balance those out as well if we were looking at a balance of enrollment so there are many 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 more conversations to be had here this is really just a rough estimate of is it feasible for us to even put sixth grade onto these two sites and how much additional square footage would we need it will then become um, incumbent upon the board our community our FPC to really examine what options exist and in what order do we really want to look at those options? Thank you. Um, so Todd, I have a macro level question uh, just to get some clarity on, on how the next couple of months are going to unfold. So in August, as a board member, um, what am I going to be presented with? I mean, I know that's really broad, but I guess my, my question is, in August, am I going to be, is, is it like thumbs up, thumbs down on, on one package, or is it, like either either I like the way it's presented or I'm not comfortable moving forward at all or I mean like for example like like O'Neill we have some the options there uh, I'm not I'm sorry Herrick we have some options there is that going to just be determined behind the scenes and then we're gonna have um, in August the boards be presented with that and, we're, and the board's not gonna have any opportunity to weigh in on that like I'm just trying to see where I'm gonna be involved as a board member where we're gonna be involved as a board and what kind of um, uh, decisions we're going to be a part of. Cover that. So while I mean, you were asking your question, I just asked him to put the timeline back up because there are several steps in the process and, and Amy can fill this in a little bit more, but it is important for us to keep in mind these are very high level high level kind of feasibility studies at this point. Mm -hmm. um, these are not architectural drawings or specifics on where things will actually be placed. This is really just examining can we add that square footage to those sites and then we still have those other um, steps that we have to go through to really examine what does that square footage look like. So mm -hmm. as you look here at the timeline um, in August you'll see um, step six is the facility master plan <coughs> beginning to be recommended to the board, but we're still evaluating the finances and the implementation strategies, meaning kind of what comes next, what other things do we need to evaluate. It wouldn't be until December that the board would be asked to potentially vote on a plan. Mm -hmm. Right. The Amy, I know you can fill that in way better than I can. But perfect. A simplified um, and, and I guarantee that the plan isn't going to be right going in the first time around. It's a process. so. Um, the, uh, it's not 
these are high level concept bubble diagrams for square footages only. As we uh, develop the master facility plan, once you get through that process, there's a whole other series uh, of user groups and um, staff that you need to talk to, community to, to engage in order to dive into those details and, and what that's really gonna be. This, to, this gives you a ballpark on, on um, square footage that is needed to be added and, and what some of those high priorities are from the community. Um, so as a board, I mean, you guys can, after we share the first initial concepts, um, providing your feedback is critical uh, and, and, and the direction that you feel that the community, if we, if we need to, have we gone too far, um, that's the time to speak up. And if we need to take some steps back or reevaluate um, uh, what the priorities that we're looking at. Um, but it, it truly is up to the board to make that decision. So in, in August, generally speaking, it's still very big picture. Yes. And it'll be refined in much greater detail in between August and, and December. Correct. And you have, you, you know, not having gone out and had, you know, the conversation piece and, as we develop this timeline, I think we all envisioned some, you know, additional levels of, some, of community engagement sessions, uh, information sessions, you know, that, that would be put out there to, to discuss, go through the concept pieces, you know, as to, as to what has been developed so far and see where everyone's at, uh, adjustments, you know, these two concepts, for Herrick, there are differences in, in square footage, so there's differences in cost. And so having that conversation of to how much is this, you know, and how does that work out with the, you know, all of that overall and what's, what is the community and, and, and people thinking and, and looking at, and what's the final piece to come, you know, into that uh, as we get into the winter um, in November and December. So to so clarify, what we're doing here at this point is we're looking at what's feasible. So as we move forward and we work through the educational components of the strategic plan, we know what's possible for us to do within sort of this framework that we're creating. Is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah it, right now you're getting the report that is, is geared or, or focused on answering the questions in step three and four. So we're still pretty early, but it's really about what do we want, the priorities, what does the Instructional Model Review Council tell us about exploring that 6-8 middle school model, uh, but there definitely are, there's a lot more to do. But we couldn't do that 6-8 model if the building, if there wasn't a potential, if it wasn't feasible to do, mm -hmm. do some construction there. Right. Appreciate it. Right, yeah. right. It, and, and again, those, those will, there will be costs associated with that, and so you don't want to mm -hmm. get too far down the right. architectural design of it in paying for those fees mm -hmm. if, in fact, at the end of, of this analysis, we determine, the board determines or the community determines we don't have the money or don't want, want to invest in that manner mm -hmm. in our schools. So, um, so you really do need to be careful about how, much, how, how far into the weeds you get at this step of the process. I have a question. Uh, you might have said it, and I, um, I didn't catch it. But for the t on the twenty first and the twenty second, what is what is the what does the community engagement look like? I went to one of them before where we placed the stickers on, and like what was important to us: the yellow, red, and green. What what it what exactly is the community engagement? What are you asking? The community engagement session will be a a presentation of both uh, a short presentation of the instructional model review council. And this presentation, um, and then a series of several questions for people, you know, giving them a, asking asking for some feedback. Where you know, what are they thinking? What are they seeing? What are the uh, what more do they want to see? Um, I'm trying to think of the other questions that we went through. Yeah, so we've got a series of you know four five questions at the most for people to respond to. As it uh, pertains to six, eight middle schools or like the elementary as well? to the, the 45 minutes of the six, eight model as well as uh, this, this presentation. And it's a 45 minute window. Uh, so it is a short period of time. Um, you know, they can respond afterwards. It'll be electronic um, or paper if they want to, you know, to do that. Um, but that's, that'll be the format for that, those two days. As so, well as the staff presentation on the point. 
So at this point, Tracy, it really is getting feedback on the step three and four, the outcomes of those steps three and four. So as we look through the presentation tonight, it really is getting feedback on the guiding principles for facility planning. Do those seem like the highest priorities? Are they well articulated? Are they easy to understand for our community? The um, four pieces, the maintenance, uh, the safe and health. Nope, so earlier in the presentation, oh, the guiding okay. principles. And then there's another piece where we're looking at the key drivers of the plan. Um, is that making sense to the community? What more information might they need? Um, are there elements here that that really need to be built out a little further? Those the feedback on those because that really sets our priorities. That really um, determines what those key drivers are of the work within the master facility plan. Um, because we're looking at the six eight middle schools, there we will be showing some of these pictures. Um, but again, these are pretty high level, and so we're not intending at this point to get. Um, really into the weeds here um, but just to examine is it feasible um, at this point and get some feedback on that along with um, some of the instructional model review council's uh, findings from their research okay, okay. question mm -hmm. um, so in the big picture we would need we will need to be making a decision about the six to eight model prior to December <coughs> is that what right. I'm hearing Facilities need to follow instruction. Instruction <laughs> comes first, so that that is a part of that that'll that'll have to come. That'll have to. That'll be part of that whole process and that evaluation, uh, because obviously, what what is needed in your facilities is going to follow right. what okay. what the instructional goal and, and long term plan is for the district. Yes, thank you. And I would I would also add. It, it is important. We can make that decision. The board can make that decision, but we will need. Um, to, we can't move sixth grade over to the middle schools right. without some substantial additions, right. which, you know, there's a cost to that. And so we will need to be thinking through how are we going to fund uh, those additions if, in fact, it may be the, the greatest idea ever and we may really, really want to <coughs> pursue that, but we'll need to find the funding to support that plan as well. And so the, that some of the work that will be happening in um, July and August um, will come back again. Um, the team will come back again in, in August or September, and then we'll have to kind of flesh that out by December. Um, and again, the, the timeline can certainly be adjusted if, if it's determined we're just, we really need to slow things down, we need to examine this a little bit further. It doesn't have to be by December, but that's what the timeline calls for at this point. Mm -hmm. The uh, May 21st and 22nd dates, what's, what does the awareness campaign look like to engage the community in that timeline? Those will be going out tomorrow. I think they went out. I think they already they went out. out. Okay, they went out, yes. So we'll be putting those out. And those we already went out and we'll do something more. It's We've been, obviously dates are getting, calendar is getting very full. Mm -hmm. So we're working within that framework to try to, to get out as much communication and get that time in uh, for these sections as we're going forward. Knowing that there are, and there will be more, you know, engagement sessions as you go through of the process, you know, into the fall as well. Is is there a uh, just because uh, calendars do get full and community engagement is, is an important part of this process? Is there a way in the May twenty first, twenty second to project when over the next seven months mm -hmm. we will also hold future community engagement opportunities? That's a really good idea. Even if they right. are placeholder dates, about them in the, you know, within the framework and so forth, we can see what we can do about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, well, great work so far. I know we got a lot of work ahead of us, but it's exciting to see. I know, I um, kind of feel like I have to throw up, but from excitement and a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> so I'm like, whoa. So thank you for all this hard work. Thank you. We're going to respond. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Very colorful. We don't need to take a recess, do we, Joe? Yeah. We can keep going, right? Uh, listed on tonight's agenda are 15 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? And with that, we'll move on to the reports to the board, starting with uh, Dr. Crimskull. Thank you. As you have heard this evening, we've had a busy couple of weeks since the last the board met. Um, as Jean and Todd both shared, we are working hard on the strategic plan um, and 
in preparing for the 2019-20 school year. Um, we also reorganized our Board of Education, so we certainly have been busy. Um, in addition to this diligent work, we have um, also, this is the time of year where we have a lot of celebrations happening throughout our district. And so I just want to call the board and the community's attention to some of those. We celebrated our Distinguished Service Award winners. Uh, we had a record number of nominees this year. We're really <coughs> happy with that. And Todd McDaniel and Nicole Faroli were named as our DSA winners for this year. We also celebrated our Teachers of the Year, Karen Ryan and Tracy Leach, and we also celebrated our Select 58, our eighth grade students who are recognized for that award as well. Many thanks to the foundation who helped to support um, some of those programs too. Um, our open houses at each of our schools went incredibly well. They were well attended over the last couple of weeks by our parents. Uh, thank you to our teachers and our staff who helped to make that really a wonderful celebration of our students and their learning throughout the school year as well as the opportunity for many of our students and parents to explore the grade level they might be entering in the upcoming school year. Um, we've also had teacher and staff appreciation last week um, was that really special week where our teachers and our staff are really celebrated. Uh, thank you to our parents and our PTAs and our community members who supported so many really wonderful events at our schools in celebration of our, our teachers. Thank you to the board for delivering coffee cakes to each of our schools as well. Um, we've also had the opportunity to have Kevin Russell in all of our schools. I think Kevin has now had the opportunity to visit all of our schools. He's met with our central office staff. You see him here tonight. We did a welcome reception for him, um, but we've been busy acquainting him or reacquainting him to the district as the case is, in fact. Um, on a couple of other notes, registration for the upcoming school year continues. You heard Jane this evening talk about how important those numbers are. Um, we have a really good sense of what our registration is starting to look like in most of our grades. Kindergarten, we're still waiting on the O'Keefe registration to wrap up so that we can uh, rehire some of those teachers back. Um, and then we also have some part-time teachers who um, we're still waiting on that those enrollment figures before we can call them back to duty as well. Um, but beyond that, you'll see on tonight's consent agenda, um, many of our teachers are being called back um, at this point. And so we're really excited to be <coughs> able to uh, recall those teachers. Um, we also had a half day of school improvement last Thursday. Our teachers engaged in a variety of learning and professional development activities, along with collaboration and school improvement work at their schools for that afternoon. So that was a really great day for, for so many of our teachers. Um, and let's see, I think that, that pretty well wraps up um, my report to the board. We do have a, a number of things on our consent agenda and later in the agenda as well. Um, and I'm excited to have a new board here to help us move forward as we plan for the upcoming school year. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. I guess not. It has been a busy time of year. and Super busy yeah, this time of year. But it's year. fun too. All right, then uh, with that, we're going to move on to our monthly business and our treasury report with Todd Drake. See if I can keep this one as exciting as the last one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have your year-to-date report, uh, or your month year-to-date report in the, in the packet. Uh, salaries, expire, I'm sorry, uh, overall expenditures are still within budget uh, frames and within uh, where they were comparative to previous year. Uh, so that is always a good sign. Uh, revenue, uh, we did receive, as we hope and expect that we did receive uh, state revenue in the month of April, um, and so that helped us. Last month, we did report to the board that we still are, were concerned about cash on hand and whether we had, um, whether the money would be available for uh, making our June payroll, uh, the bills, the, you know, I am sorry and I am thankful, the bills went, the tax <laughs> bills went out on time. Um, and so there is a mid-May distribution from the DuPage County Treasurer's Office as well as a May 3rd or 5th distribution. Uh, so those funds will be uh, in-house um, to make that, you know, that, that piece as well as with the state uh, money that has come in and we actually just received a corporate personal, a check for our corporate personal property replacement tax which is a tax that comes from the state that's local revenue um, that came in on Friday and it's actually funny, it comes still as a paper check. Um, 
And so with all of those things, you know, we were in a position that we, you know, we won't have to be looking at any short-term borrowing, which was, has been a concern of ours. We still have low cash, but we will have uh, enough um, with that piece, with those revenues, particularly the property taxes coming in um, prior to that, that first June payroll date. Um, as I said, state money uh, did come in. I don't know if anyone had heard or know, uh, seen in the news, uh, but the uh, governor commented that uh, revenue for April came in well above their projections and expectations, and therefore they hope to make their full payment to pensions. Uh, but that also means that they had enough revenue uh, to issue out uh, payments. And so uh, that was good to know. In fact, in your report, we have the report on state revenue. Um, we also report to you every, each month what, just to give an understanding of where we are and where the state's at, um, that right now is $6 billion that the state is behind in bills. That was almost 7.3, I think, last month. So. That has gone down considerably uh, in their payment structures and being able to pay off some bills. So that's a good thing overall for, for, every, for all of us. Um, other than that, on the consent agenda you have, this is the time of year bids are coming in. And so you will have this meeting and the next meeting will be even more uh, with bid approvals for items for the next year. Um, this month we have the copiers. This is something that... Uh, every so many years we do. Uh, this is a complete replacement of the copiers that we have in the district. Um, we have some projected savings for that. Uh, we will consume some of that savings because one of the things that we are able to do with this uh, restructuring is that we will have a color copier in every main office in every building starting the school year, which is something that they do not currently have. Um, so we are working that we are upgrading that. We will also be replacing, taking out some of the color printers uh, that are also in those main offices. Those are much more expensive to run than those copiers. Uh, so we're doing some efficiencies in that process. So, and uh, Katie, Han Katie Hannigan did a great job in putting all of that together and going through what was a very long process, uh, as well as James from the technology uh, working through all of that. So. We have an install in the end of June coming, uh, pending your approval, and that will be an exciting piece. Other than that, if there are any questions? Great, thank you. Excited to hear the state's paying their bills. So, <laughs> <laughs> so are we. Okay. Next, we're going to move on to the policy committee. The policy committee did meet on April the 30th, and uh, Jill Samante will report. I just wanted to give a little shout out. Thank you to all of the dedicated members of the policy committee that should <laughs> come at seven, 7 in the morning, right? It's a fun time. Um, so we went, we did a, we, we went over quite a few things in the last um, meeting. Um, for first reading, um, there's two about student rights um, and behavior on search and seizure and bus conduct and then the general school administration policies that have to deal with goals and objectives um, that was just aligned with press as well as our organizational chart and then uh, supporting documentation that changes the names of positions to go along with that um, and as well as pulling the policy for um, the controller, since we don't have one, we're going to recommend that that be um, deleted. deleted. Thank you. And then the policy 1150, the community relations, citizen communications with the schools and the board is the um, public comment section um, that we had tabled last time after the March um, meeting. At this meeting, we had more conversation um, specifically with and about uh, the three unions that are um, present at most of our board meetings and just where in policy um, specific language about their communication with the board would be. And so we tabled um, 1150 for now and then the committee received many um, supporting uh, policies where some of that language may live. Um, Mark was going to talk with um, 
the union. Um, and so coming back for the next meeting when we also discuss um, health uh, policies, um, we will discuss and figure out exactly where that all lives. Okay. Any questions? No. All right. Anything else, Tracy, to add? No, that okay. summarizes it. And with that, is there a motion to approve for first reading the following draft policies and place them on the June board agenda for final approval? 2001, goals and objectives. 2002, organizational chart. 2020, deputy superintendent. 2031, assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction. 2032, assistant superintendent for personnel. 2042, manager of business services. 2043, assistant superintendent for technology. 5121, search and seizure. And 5131.1, bus contact. Conduct. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there second. a second? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve for first reading draft policies 2001, 2002, 2020, 2031, 2032, 2042, 2043, 5121, and 5131.1, and place them on the June board agenda for final approval. Is there a motion to approve for first reading the deletion of policy 2030.5, administration controller? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried to approve for first reading the deletion of policy 2030.5, administration controller. Uh, next up is the legislative committee. The legislative committee met on April 17th, so Member Doshi. Yep, so uh, we, uh, as I mentioned in a previous uh, recap, the legislative breakfast is the Super Bowl for the legislative committee. Um, and uh, we had a, uh, we had that event uh, a couple months back. Uh, and so we debriefed at this committee meeting on uh, how that went and what could go better for uh, next time. Um, we liked the fact that we added surrounding districts as attendees. Uh, that was a helpful uh, move in the right direction, we felt. Um, the next step is to make sure that we can get more uh, representation from our legislators at the event. Uh, this time around, we had two uh, legislators represented um, at the event and one at the after party. Um, and so uh, that <laughs> we, we'd, we'd like to have, we'd like to have more you. attendees next year. Um, and uh, we came up with some strategies on, on how to make that happen. And uh, uh, if you want to hear about all the details on that, uh, Megan, is our uh, agent in charge for uh, uh, executing some of those, but we're, we're excited for the potential for more legislators to come next year. Well, I just wanna say from my perspective, it was so nice to see the surrounding districts there and, and the village turnout. Um, the turnout from that perspective was fantastic. It was very well done and your comic stylings that, that started off in the, uh, the morning were, were great as well. I'm here all week. <laughs> <laughs> Next up is the Financial Advisory Committee, um, which I'll report on. We met last Friday, May 10th. A lot of the stuff that we discussed, obviously, uh, we heard from the Business Office Report and the Treasurer's Report. Uh, couple of, a couple things to note um, in here is that we did receive the uh, state funding and, and some federal funds, so that's, that's a good place uh, to get into, and, and it was good to hear the, the confidence on no need for short-term borrowing. Um, as well as the on-time distribution of the tax, uh, de tax distributions. Uh, so just an important reminder to everybody that 80% of our revenue does come from property taxes here. So that is uh, where, the, so no matter if we see an increase in state funding or not, that's, uh, that is important, but it is, uh, it is a lot more important uh, us waiting for that timeline of our property tax. So a couple key things that we focused on, uh, one was uh, potential investment options. Right now, we tend to use uh, secured CDs, uh, which, has had, which has been doing fairly well for us, but we are trying to look at further options because with the amount of money that we're investing, um, there's a significant amount of money, that uh, additional amount of money, uh, if we looked at a couple of different options. So we're trying to be, uh, so next week we're gonna, I'm sorry, next meeting we're gonna invite in, um, 
a group to talk to us about some further options. Now, obviously, with higher returns comes potential higher risks. Being a, uh, being a school district, we can't take on a lot of risk. But we'll have to talk those and, and measure them out and see because uh, I believe we said that the amount of additional revenue that we could make if we uh, were to adjust that to, to maximize the output could be somewhere equivalent. We're talking the difference in potential staff positions. So that's something that we want to want to take seriously. We also really dove into a, a little bit more discussion around Longfellow and the fact that that building is um, not only not serving our needs, um, keeping some of our administrators separated from the other ones, but is not a cost effective building to run. Um, and, and at the same time also potentially has other values. So we're taking very seriously and, that, and that's going to be part of the overall strategic plan that we're talking about in that facilities master plan. But we're making sure we're also looking at that for the unique space and the unique issues uh, that that poses as well. So uh, we had a nice uh, dialogue about that and we're going to continue that conversation as well over the next couple of months. So with that, I'll take any questions. And that, con that concludes my report. The district leadership team did not meet since the last board meeting. All right. Moving on, we have no discussion items this month, so the next step will be our reception of visitors. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Uh, reminder that criticism of individuals is not in order. We encourage you to keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. Uh, do we have any cards? No. All right, so at this time we have received no cards. So if there is anybody out there that is interested in speaking, we just ask that you step up to the podium, state your name and your attendance area, and then provide your public comment. Really? Two meetings in a row. It's unheard of. All right. And with that, are we all comfortable kind of skipping over recess and moving on to? Uh... Sure. Okay. Take it. All right. We're going to start with the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested corrections to any of the minutes that were presented to you in your packet of materials? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from April 16th, 2019, the board tour and Whittier PTA meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes from April 16, 2019 board meeting, our board tour, Whittier PTA meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the April 25th, 2019 special meeting, board reorganization as presented? So moved. Second. It, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes from the April 25th, 2019 special meeting, board reorganization as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the April 29th, 2019 budget workshop as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes from the April 2019, 2019 budget workshop as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the May 7th, 2019 Board Tour Indian Trail PTA meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes from the May 7th, 2019 Board Tour Indian Trail PTA meeting as presented. Next up is our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. 
Thank you. I will just simply announce, in addition to rehiring many of our teachers, we are thrilled this evening to welcome four new administrators to our district, three of whom are here with us this evening. Um, the board just approved and hired Amy Reed as principal of Herrick Middle School for the upcoming school year. And we also have Zachary Kraft, who was hired as principal of Highland Elementary School. Zach, would you stand up? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be a part of the Highland team and the Donner's Girl 58 team. I've heard nothing but positive things about the students, the community, the teachers. I'm, I'm very excited to get to work, so thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you. You're welcome. We also have approved this evening uh, two new positions. Uh, one is a curriculum coordinator and assistant principal at Highland Elementary School, Christine Preister. Priester, thank you. Priester, Christine, come on up. And we also have Matt Jewell, who will be working with us at Fairmont Elementary School and also as a curriculum coordinator. So welcome to both of you as well. Well, since Zach set the standard that we're going to say something, thank you for the... <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. I'm really excited to join the Downers Grove team and get started at Highland. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise, very glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. And I look forward to working with uh, Dr. Russell as well. Welcome to you. We had a really strong pool of candidates for each of these positions, and we're just thrilled with um, the choices of the committees and, and thrilled that the board supported those recommendations this evening. So welcome to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, our recommendations for actions. The first one up is the Fuse Studio Resource Adoption. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of the Fuse Studio Creative Package for a cost of $34,500? So moved. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the purchase of the Fuse Studio Creative Package for a cost of $34,500. Uh, next up is the C is Seesaw for Schools contract. Is there a motion to approve a three-year contract for Seesaw for Schools for a total cost of $46,413? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve a three-year contract for Seesaw for Schools for a total cost of $46,413. Uh, next up is the SACID lease agreement. Is there a motion to approve the classroom lease agreement between SACID and Downers Grove Grade School District 58 for the 2019-2020 school year? So moved. Second. Any discussion? How do we establish that, that price? That is a price that's set by SACID. Okay. So it is So it is. any, yes, okay. any room that's rented out by SACID is, I think, uh, the same price throughout. If Jessica, is that? That's, that's accurate. Thank you. Thanks. Anything else? All right. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the classroom lease agreement between SACID and the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 for the 2019-2020 school year. Um, next up we have a bid for copiers. Is there a motion to approve a three-year contract pending attorney review with proven IT for 36 copier leases at a rate of $6,738.78 per month and a corresponding maintenance agreement for all those devices. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve a three-year contract pending attorney review with proven IT for 36 copier leases at a rate of $6,738.78 per month and a corresponding maintenance agreement for those devices. 
Next up is the bid for custodial supplies. Is there a motion to approve the bid for custodial supplies as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the bid for custodial supplies as presented. Um, the resolution authorizing accounting transfers to debt service fund to implement, uh, to implement state regulations. Due to an error that resolution as presented, uh, there was an error in that resolution as presented, so we're going to table this item until the June board meeting. Um, so we do have a second reading, though, of, of some policies. Uh, is there a motion to adopt revisions to policies 5100, admission residents, 5101, school admissions and student transfers, 5131, student behavior and discipline, 5138, prevention of and response to bullying, and 5138.2, sexual har harassment prohibited, and 6002, six Title I programs? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Motion carried to adopt revisions to policies 5100, 5101, 5131, 5138, 5138.2, and 6002. So uh, next up, we have a couple of announcements. Please make note of the dates below. Uh, Tuesday, May 14th at 6 p.m., there is a board tour and PTA meeting at Indian Trail. Thursday, May 16th. No. no. Yeah, we that was last week. week. Oh. It's LCRO. Yeah, it's actually El Sierra. Okay. Well, then on May 14th at 6 p.m., there's a board tour PTA meeting at El Sierra. Mm -hmm. Thursday, May 16th at 4 p.m. is the DGEEA board and administrative collaborative meeting at Nani's. Um, Tuesday, May 21st at 7 a.m. is the policy committing, co committee meeting at the ASC. Tuesday, May 21st at 4 p.m. is the district leadership team at Longfellow. Friday, May 24th at 11.30 a.m. is the retiree luncheon at the Hyatt Lodge in Oakbrook. And Wednesday, June 5th at 7 p.m. will be our next regular board meeting. All right. Uh, the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move in closed session to discuss? Not this one, not the first one, right? Uh, collective negotiating matters between the district and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees, 5 ILCS 122C2, the placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters relating to individual students, 5 ILCS 122C10, student disciplinary cases, 5 ILCS 122C9, and we don't need litigation. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The board will now move into close session after a short recess at on 9 p.m.